uh, so we'll, we'll dive in because we have a limited amount of time and we have an extraordinary panel that we spend hours with each of these guys. But uh, we have a limited amount of time, so we're going to go deep fast. Um, but first of all, we're here uh, because it is beautiful, the Peterson Art Museum, um, because its organization, Los Angeles World Affairs Council, the Peterson Museum, have had the vision to bring us all together and to look at the radical, in innovative, imaginative things happening in transportation. So this is a really unique opportunity for us to, to explore. Keep coming in. There's some people out there who still want to file in. Let's, we've got plenty of room over here. It'll be easier to see. My name is August Bradley. I am the producer and host of Mind and Machine Discussion on the Future, a talk show where we do weekly interviews with people at the forefront of transformational technologies. It's a podcast and a YouTube channel at mindandmachine.io. And through that channel, I have the privilege to, to meet fascinating people like these guys. So let's dive into what these guys are up to. Um, first of all, let's start with Jill Sharapo, who is uh, with Intel. She's the head of strategic marketing of the automotive division. Uh, so two or three minutes on, on what you guys are focused on. Sure. Uh, my name is Jill Sharapo. I am in the automotive group at Intel. If any of you saw anything about the acquisition of Mobileye, our entire group is now under Mobileye. So that's made our jobs very interesting this year. Not only have we been part of a reverse acquisition, but we've also had the distinct pleasure of being able to sell and understand Mobileye's products, their impact on the world, their ability to reduce collisions, and how those products are actually the derivatives of the future of autonomous driving for our Intel platform and Intel. Fantastic. Then we have George Carrion. George is with Panasonic City Now, a vision of smart city uh, that's developing today, but has a bold uh, ambition for the future. George, thank you, August. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Okay, we're getting there. <laughs> we'll get you going. So, uh, I'm with, I am with Panasonic City Now. Panasonic, uh, everyone has heard of Panasonic. Very few people realize what Panasonic is today. We just celebrated our 100th anniversary in March. And uh, from an automotive perspective, uh, we participated about seven steps of the value chain from advanced driver assist, audio infotainment, connectivity, safety and comfort, uh, e-vision, and energy. And just from an energy perspective, the Tesla data factory as an example is 51% owned by Panasonic. So we're deeply vested both in the automotive uh, uh, OEM industry as well as the Department of Transportation uh, segment where we recently signed a five-year, $72 million contract with Colorado Department of Transportation to deploy the country's first connected vehicle platform statewide. Not a science experiment, not some R&D stuff, full-scale uh, statewide deployment of the country's first connected vehicle platform. And then from a smart cities perspective, which is the team I lead, we focus on uh, serving cities, utilities, state departments of transportation, and uh, real estate developers. And we're uniquely experienced at bringing them all together, not just to the table, but to the same side of the table. So it's an open invitation. We uh, anchor a 400-acre transit-oriented development called Pena Station Next outside the Denver airport. It is uh, some of the smartest and most sustainable dirt in this country. And uh, if you go two or three Denver, I'd invite you to stop there. Just a two or three uh, unique examples. It is the country's first uh, autonomous vehicle, uh, first mile, last mile connection from a train station to a bus stop on public roads. It's also the first connected vehicle deployment in the country. And we'll be opening a uh, connected uh, mobility center of excellence very shortly. Think of it as a global we work for all things connected. Great, and uh, Rish Sharma with Pilatus, an intuitive artificial intelligence company. Intuitive intelligence. Yeah, if it's uh, artificial, it's not exactly intuitive. Okay. intuitive intelligence. <laughs> so, hey everyone, uh, Rishabh Sharma, I'm with Pilatus, I'm the CEO and founder, and our work with Pilatus is focused <coughs> on building intuitive systems. What does that mean? Uh, we, instead of taking this API-based siloed approach towards uh, AI, which is sort of a cookie cutter in approach, uh, when you look at traditional AI systems that are out there, uh, and you get back a response based on a you know, JSON feed, most of the AI systems are not exactly dissecting it how a human being really looks at it. I mean, a human being is a complex mechanism. There's psychology, there's uh, intuition, there's all kinds of different things that are going on. So we are building 
custom solutions from the ground up designed for our clients, which are working with very complex lifts. And uh, our hope is to paint a picture of AI that is not exactly scary where the robots take over, but rather is a human first approach to algorithm design, a human first approach to AI design. That's what we call intuitive intelligence. I'm looking forward to talking more about that. Great. And Dr. Morigari from Caltech's CAST Autonomous Lab. Good morning. Uh, I'm Mori Gary, I'm Director of Center for Autonomous Systems and Technologies at Caltech. Also head of the aerospace department over there. Uh, CAST is a new center that uh, we established about nine months ago. And our main objective is to bring our academic research out of their academic units and create a venue for them to actually enter systems, autonomous systems. And uh, in that respect, we have established uh, several moonshots, not just for us, also for the rest of the academic uh, community and also industry. And one of the projects that we are really keen on is hybrid uh, flying systems that can address some of the, the today's transportation problems. Fantastic. So we'll, we'll go deeper into all of this. So Jill, let's start with you. The, the arc of the conversation I see here is we're going to talk with the look at the stuff that's more immediate and grounded and evolving, and then we're going to move increasingly to more visionary, ambitious, uh, imaginary system beyond what we have capable today. So Jill, where is the technology today for autonomous driving? Uh, aside from the legislative and consumer acceptance level, Just technically. The, technologically, is this doable? Is, it, is a fully autonomous car driving through modern city possible? It is. If you don't put, and then you start to put parameters around it, right? Within a, within a certain geofenced area that's been mapped and given a bunch of um, parameters, yes, it's possible. When we start to put all these other things on it, that's when the, uh, when the conversation becomes more interesting. In other words, how far can the car go? What are the legal and, and legislative uh, parameters around it? Um, what does the DMV for that state say the cars can do in that area? So there are a lot of things there. But I think I'll, I'll go back to your first question, which is what's going on technically. Technically, there are two things. And the things we mostly see in the industry are all about level five and level four self-driving cars. Who's going to be first? Who's going to win the self-driving car battle? Is it Waymo? Is it Uber? Is it Tesla? Who's going to be the first? I call it to have a man on the moon. And I think that's great and it's noble and it's the ideal situation that we have vehicles that transport us from one situation to another economically and safely. There should be no reason for accidents in this entire world, right? That's the nirvana, that's the vision. But the reality today is that we have this technology available and many of it have it on our cars today. How many of you have lane departure warning or forward collision warning on your vehicles today? Raise your hand. Okay, that's actually pretty good. That technology is a derivative of what an autonomous car does. So those cameras and those sensors that are telling you if you are outside your lane are going to become the same sensors and technology that the car actually makes decisions based on. That data it's pulling in, it's turning it into something digital and it's doing mathematical equations on it and then it moves on and it actually actuates your car. If, it has, if, you, if you have one of the cars that will actually pull you back in the lane, that's a version of autonomous driving. So as you can see, this industry on, on the technology side, companies like Mobileye have been doing this for 20 years. 24 million vehicles on the road today are based on Mobileye technology. That means that this life-saving technology is available today. It's not standardized and it's not mandated by the government yet, your seatbelts and anti-lock brakes are, this technology is not yet. However, these are the precursors to autonomous driving. We need to respect the technology and we need to let technology companies, no EMs, continue to develop on it so we can get to that futuristic place of virtually no accidents that are caused by the vehicles. Can these current technologies for driver assistance gradually improve, or at some point do we need to have a complete rebuild to, to deliver the process? No, we'll be gradual, because you also can't turn over the entire inventory of cars in the world. I often get asked, I think Jack, you asked me today, how are the cars going to communicate with each other? Cars 
are going to always communicate with each other just the same way you and I do. If we are pulled up to a four-way stop, I will look at your car, I'll say, is that guy stopping or is he going to blow through that stop sign? That's how we communicate today. That's how autonomous cars are going to communicate in the near future as well. It's all mathematical equations. Any of the other engineers in here know when you turn things into digital components, whether they're moving or static, you can always make an accurate decision based on that motion. How are you using crowdsourced data? Oh, you're laying all the questions on me. <laughs> 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 and you're up. <laughs> um, so Mobileye has a technology um, called Roadbook. Um, or REM, and what this does is it takes the cameras that are currently on the car doing the actuation to keep you safe, and not only does it make decisions based on that data, but it pulls the data and it creates a, a road book or a map of the, car, of the roads you've driven on. It uses that data from all the cars that have driven on that road with this technology to create a map. And then we have a crowdsource map based on purposeful driven miles, right? Miles that were driven with purpose, actually I call it driven with purpose, either from fleet vehicles or trucks or taxis or school buses or the postman. We're actually taking data from cars driving on these roads with purpose versus having a fleet of dedicated vehicles that are continually driving around the city, racking up millions of miles to make sure they've mapped all of the areas of the city. That's called an open source way to create the map. Fantastic. George, connected vehicle tech is integral to the City Now project. What is it? What's the scope of what it can do? So today, about 40,000 people a year die on U.S. roadways, and about 95% of those deaths are the result of human behavior or lack of behavior. Um, connected vehicles uh, will be mandated uh, in the next few years, roughly around 2021, might be sooner, it might be later. Uh, and connected vehicles, we think of it as V to X, vehicle to everything. That's vehicle to vehicle, vehicle to infrastructure, vehicle to pedestrian, vehicle to bicycle, vehicle to electric scooter soon enough, right? It's vehicle to everything. And uh, the vehicle to vehicle mandate that is coming from the federal government will require vehicles within about a 300 meter uh, proximity to communicate with each other 10 times a second. And so of all of those, uh, the, the bulk of the death and destruction in auto accidents happens in uh, really chain events. So if this front row was uh, platooning down the highway, the first car stops, the second car sees that car and stops, but then everybody in the middle just kind of suffers the worst uh, run of that. And so it builds on the technology that is in cars today for uh, lane detection and auto braking. But it, again, now they're talking 10 times a second. And so that's much quicker than a human can react. That will save roughly 75% of all of those uh, deaths, simply because these cars are talking to each other. They're talking to infrastructure. Think of that as digital signage. Uh, right now, if you see a digital sign on the highway, it's pretty much worthless, right? Um, because it's just not granular enough. Uh, and so this makes it, re it, it transitions to near real time information to the driver of the vehicle and the infrastructure. And really, if you think about data 10 times a second, my God, no traffic management system in the world has ever contemplated that level of, of data. It's petabytes upon petabytes every year, 99% of which is you know, not really interesting, 1% is extremely critical. And so we're building that uh, V to X data platform with uh, Colorado DOT to really deploy this uh, across the country. We're demonstrating it at Pena Station Next right now in terms of what happens when a vehicle is in an accident, what, uh, what happens to the vehicles immediately behind it, are they automatically braked, the vehicles a little further, are they automatically notified and rerouted. You know, you take that to scale and you've saved tens of thousands of lives a year millions and tens of millions of, of lost hours and, and other uh, productivity impacts. That's amazing. It, it, the, the saving of lives this, on this scale is so astonishing. It's easy to gloss over it because it's just a data point in and of itself. But beyond that, how else will it affect the way cars and people and traffic flows and interacts? Well, it will, it will certainly uh, improve safety considerably. It will also improve efficiency because now you can also have uh, more vehicle, you can have greater vehicle density in any uh, particular uh, highway mile. You can have, which then requires fewer lanes to be built, right? You build a lane, it fills up. It's not really helping with efficiency. 
as those uh, as that technology integrates, because that's a Department of Transport. The highways are managed by the DOTs, right? <coughs> Cities manage their city streets. Um, if you're driving on a road, you don't really care if you get off the highway and drive through the city street. You expect a comparable level of safety and security and performance. And so as this technology gets integrated into city uh, traffic management uh, infrastructure, then um, the short order is greater efficiency, greater convenience, less congestion. Uh, the second order uh, in time will be a, a shift in parking policies. Right, most cities today, about a third of the city is parking. If, you know, is that glass half empty or half full? I think that glass is disgusting. Uh, and, and, and disgustingly inefficient. Uh, and so it will impact uh, parking codes. It will impact how we use and value that very precious real estate in our city at a minimum. Mm -hmm. it, does this inherently apply specifically to autonomous driving, or is this going to uh, also guide great, driving? Great question. So vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle technology doesn't care if a computer is driving a car or if a carbon-based life form is driving a car. It is about communicating that information V to V is real, V to X is really, think of it as the network operating system that will enable large scale autonomy. Ultimately, it will, it will shift more and more autonomous. Right? We, we think of mobility today as increasingly shared, electric, and autonomous. Shared's already here, electric's increasingly here, autonomous is coming at us really fast. And on top of that, I would say it's also going to be increasingly connected. Fantastic. Maury, the, what are the moonshot projects you guys are working on for casting? Facility. Well, I, we don't have enough time to go off all of Some them. highlights. The one that uh, I would like to actually relate to this panel is uh, called Transporters. And the idea is that uh, can we have uh, an you know, autonomous system that can be called like an Uber you know, ambulance uh, that not only can be on the, ground, on the ground, but also can use the third dimension in order to avoid the gridlocks and you know, congestion. Um, I kind of disagree that there's not going to be less congestion. I think there'll be more cars on the streets because people that couldn't drive or didn't like to drive are going to be driving. So now imagine scenarios that you know you basically uh, need an ambulance so that you need to be required to get to a hospital in 20 minutes or 30 minutes in LA. So that's going to be a challenge. So we decided to look at what is available uh, in terms of technology, whether we can actually design a system can be hybrid, means that it can basically land without having uh, a pilot uh, uh, required to fly it and also can be personalized. That means you know that if you call it, where to take you in terms of emergencies. Think of you know floods that we had or uh, you know, all the fires that we had recently. Many people got trapped. There was no way that the helicopter pilot could land or trucks or emergency vehicles could get to them. So we designed a system that can fly um, for 20 minutes at 75 miles per hour and it can basically land in any uh, condition in terms of weather and also trains. And that's the focus of uh, our, uh, one of the flagship of uh, our uh, projects. Um, it, it's called Flying Ambulance. It basically can take one person and uh, take, take that person out of, out of harm's way. And it's totally autonomous. Uh, our first flight in the modern scale going to be for, uh, go from Caltech campus to JPL and come back autonomously. That means no operator and um, uh, it can basically uh, take up to 600 kilograms and uh, fly at 75 miles per hour. Wow. So um, I'm so happy you're talking about flying cars because it seems we were promised this years ago by science fiction. <laughs> <laughs> somebody's working on this. Well, now we have been totally aware of the limitations, correct? Mm -hmm. So um, one of them is policies. The other one is the battery technology. Uh, I don't think that uh, anybody can, even now, can dream taking a flying car, go from LA to San Diego and come back. But you can go from downtown LA to you know the, some nearby hospital. That you can actually uh, think of battery technology today that you can put it together in a system that can provide that kind of right. service. So for us, it's a short-term approach to future flying cars. Right. And obviously, you have to pick a specific use case to implement. And it's hard to imagine a better one than ambulances. 
But are you thinking about how this might roll out beyond ambulances into general public use, ultimately? Well, of course, you know, this can be a personal and then also the, the short distance delivery, you know, <coughs> medical, correct? And also think of uh, for, uh, you know, the, when you, we can basically send you know, the swarm of these uh, machines to rescue, you know, in the battle zones, you know, people, the wounded to get them out or any other you know, emergency situations. Uh, so that, that's, I think, the ultimate dream that we have, to be able to help rescue and save lives. Amazing. Do you have any sense of timeline, or is it just evolves as, as it evolves? Well, I'm trying to not to uh, <laughs> throw off questions to like, because to <laughs> the comment you made about flying cars. But we believe that with current technology, in five years, we should be able to have uh, prototypes flying. And are you working on any other modes of transportation? I know you have bipedal machines, two-foot walking machines. Sure. Uh, I think one of the first questions people ask us is who's going to help the patient to get into the space? Correct. Okay. So um, uh, we are designing the autonomous stretchers and also autonomous bipedals that can actually help the person to upload to the stretcher and you know, to the you know, flying car or flying ambulance. Fantastic. And Rich? Beyond navigating autonomous vehicles, how can, I'm going to say artificial intelligence or whatever evolution of that you're working on, how can that help the transportation experience? So, like, my I, uh, I love the fact that you use the word experience because driving is an experience. And how many of us get inside the car, we are stuck in traffic, and that's a very stressful experience. Being stuck in traffic is a very stressful experience. We even started to dread it. Like, oh my god, I gotta go drive from here to here. We don't go to certain places because I won't find parking. And where intuitive intelligence comes in is when you get inside that environment, it shouldn't feel inorganic. Your car can have a personality. Your car can understand you. Your car can understand are you in a bad mood? Are you in a good mood? Then I can start correlating that to your driving patterns and see. Is this person more likely to actually have an accident today because I'm actually noticing all the telltales that this person might be depressed? It's like you pull the car over to the side and just ask, hey, you, know, you seem to be a little bit down. Hey, you seem to be a little bit down. Would you like me to call your mom? Because apparently, it's not when you call your mom, you seem to you know, not be stressed out, or maybe stressed out in my case. You get therapy from your car. Well, it's more, more than therapy, it is an acknowledgement. It is an acknowledgement, because most of the time, we go through this life feeling that we're not being acknowledged. And all of us are making a shift towards technology to find different ways of validation. When you look at all the different social media networks, what are there really ways to validate an existence? Acknowledge. So if you get in the car, and if your car understands you, it knows, hey, you seem a little bit off today. Yeah, that feels good. That feels good. You know? and, and for us, it is about creating a safer driving experience. And because the headspace has got to do so much with how you drive. We're currently um, sponsoring uh, Formula 2 Le Mans driver. He's a former Le Mans champion as well. And we're doing a lot of uh, research there with understanding how his psychological headspace correlates to his actual performance on track. When you're in 300 miles per hour, that matters. Wow. And so the, the car is monitoring your moods and biometrics over time and then looking for variations. Is that kind of the idea? Yes, absolutely. It's, you know, it's looking at patterns, it's understanding what exactly is happening now. If you have a connected car system as well, then you can actually understand that against a larger landscape as well because you're collecting data from the other places as well. Again, just metadata, not like someone By other places, you mean other people in other cars? Yes, absolutely. And, and also this can help the insurance industry as well. You can actually start understanding what kind of people are more likely to get into an accident. How does that affect their insurance policy? Okay, and then it's kind of, is it about shaping behaviors then, in a way? It is about shaping behaviors, absolutely. It is about being aware of behaviors as well. And if we can catch that behavior trend or tick before it becomes destructive, we're saving lives. This can, this is all about awareness. If you had a bad day, you get in a car, you just like, you just rage and you get back home. Okay. But, you know, if you're like, hold on a second. And how does the machine <clears throat> develop this intuition? How does the machine become intuitive? 
So this is through a variety of factors of really getting to know you. It really comes down to sensors, but you are talking about integrating multiple, multiple, multiple disciplines and subfields of AI, which is why we call it intuitive intelligence, because that is what our focus has been. And uh, most of it is proprietary, but just to kind of give you an idea, you're reading up all the different cues, you know, your body language, you know, your driving patterns, even the kind of music you're listening to. Is there a correlation between how you drive, between how the weather is, and is there grogginess in your voice? Are you more likely to do that today? And really integrating and synthesizing all those telltales or essentially signals that a human being gives off. Right, fascinating. That brings up a good point. Let's open that up to the, the panel more broadly. The idea of the car learning from our behaviors, either our driving behaviors or our behaviors in the car, and then shaping us, uh, perhaps even guiding us to have better behaviors. Perhaps it senses a beer bottle open in the car. It might discourage <laughs> drunk driving or, or, or sensing. I mean, that could totally happen, right? Well, no, I actually, happen. I'd like to flip that. I okay. think that, has anyone in the room ridden in an autonomous vehicle? OK, so some people have. Was it compelling? Was it exciting? You know, they, they run the gamut. Some of them are completely boring, and you get in a autonomous vehicle, and you're riding to your location. The people walking are walking past you. <laughs> <laughs> the car you're in is safe, but it's incredibly boring and slow, and you just want to get out. <laughs> On the other hand, if any of you rode some of the Aptiv cars that were at CES last year, or the, the Lyft Aptiv cars, they were really great. They were driving through Vegas. They were aggressive. They were getting into traffic. They were figuring out. My car actually got stuck in an intersection when the light turned and all the traffic went. And traffic was coming around us like a river rock. And the car figured out what to do. But I think that having a car take the personality of the driver and the environment they're in is also going to be very important. So can your car read your personality? Yeah. It probably will be able to, but more than likely, I mean, what we need more is that that car can emulate the way we drive. I have a 16-year-old daughter who has a Jeep. I seriously can't stand even go to Walmart with her because I have a heart attack. She doesn't drive well. She's aggressive. She stops too soon. She doesn't. It, it makes me crazy. I do not want my autonomous vehicle to drive like that. Hello, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> Would you like to move to the side and do a quick meditation session? Because I'm detecting stress levels in your voice. She's terrible. But, but you wanted to guide her be driving behavior to a safer... Absolutely. Habit. And in fact, so she has a Jeep Wrangler. And there, there's a story behind this. But we really want her to have a car with autonomous features on it. Or at least driver assist features. Because that's what I do for a living. Right? You'd think we'd buy a car with those features. But she really wanted this car and she earned it. So we had to get, so we put this aftermarket mobilized system on it. This aftermarket system alerts her if she goes outside of her lane. If any of you have driven with a 16 year old, they have no <laughs> clue how to stay in the lanes. It's just the hardest thing for them. So if she goes outside the lane without her blink rod, it beeps at her. And if she gets too close to the car in front of her, it beeps at her. Or if she's coming in hot, you know, like not breaking <laughs> fast enough, it alerts her. And the first week she came home and she was really frustrated. And last week, she came home and she said, Mom, I can tell I'm driving safer. Like, I'm making better decisions. But, but, but she's so learning cool. from it. It's teaching. She's learning from it. And just these basic technologies, they're very basic. And I'm sure those of you who raise your hand and have the beep, beep, beep in your car. That reduces your possibility of being in an accident by 30%. That's the technology that's available today. And this is what's leading to autonomous driving. However, even those technologies, you can tune them to mimic your behavior. Like I have hers dialed in real tight, right? <laughs> Mine lets me go a little over the lanes, which isn't good either. But you can tune these things to mimic your behavior and take on your personality. But, but to some degree, we don't want people to go too far, right, as a society? Absolutely. Right, right, so right, right. Do you envision constraints? Absolutely. Is speeding even going to be possible? Is what going to be possible? Is speeding even going to be possible in the connected future? <laughs> well, um, I think it depends. If it's in an autonomous mode, like the cars that are driving around in autonomous mode, they have very spe specific parameters of how far they can go past the speed limit. Like, you know, a cop will pull you over here within 5 or 10. Or, you know, I think they're doing some of that. Right. Um, others, they don't, right? right? You can dial that in. It's technology. You can tell it. You can make it do whatever you want it to do. Right. George, well, how does your system 
<coughs> emphasize behavior that's conducive to a, a larger society. So uh, in addition to the connected vehicle development work we're doing with CDOT, we're also working with a French autonomous shuttle company called Easy Mile. They've opened their North American headquarters uh, uh, with us in, in Denver. And uh, to your comment about, you know, the, you know, the shuttle is first mile, last mile, right? This is a 14 mile an hour vehicle. And to me, from a, from a passenger perspective, the real um, aha to me was when they, when they talk about giving people their very first shuttle ride. And again, it's just first mile, last mile. We're not getting on the highway. We're not getting on 45 mile an hour roads. That's, you know, that's the Tesla, Google, right? That's a different kind of use case. Um, but when people take their first autonomous shuttle ride, and after the first few seconds, they just go fall into what they were doing normally if they would be a passenger. So that is a very strong indicator that the public will readily embrace autonomous driving. And again, it, it is far more complex than we're going to be able to talk about in this very limited window. Um, and I would say, just to your earlier comment as well, uh, I, I, I do believe we have hit peak personal auto ownership as a culture. But I do agree that we're going to have far more vehicles on the road. And my comment about congestion, I would just call, I would say that it's traffic flows will be optimized, right? The space available and the amount of vehicles, and even the speed limit. The speed limits exist from my perspective based on historical understanding of the vehicle performance and how people worked and, and performed. In a highly connected, highly autonomous uh, environment, uh, I don't think my grandchildren, right? My, my children are just a little bit older than yours. My wife is itching for grandchildren, right? I don't think my grandchildren will ever touch a steering wheel. Right? And so when in a highly connected autonomous world, uh, what is that speed limit for? And why is it 55 if it's all electric, clean energy? Right? So we're going to rethink several fundamental underlying premises. Yeah. Absolutely fascinating. And drinking and texting is an example. Sure. Oh, we shouldn't drink and text while driving. That's because you're responsible for navigating the vehicle. Could lead to a lot of urban sprawl. Because now I don't have to, that two hour commute is much less of a hassle because I can sleep, I can watch a movie, right? I can drink, whatever, not in the morning. <laughs> and if I'd I like to clarify I that. I can leave, I can leave. Maury, how are you collecting data to shape the, the, the flying ambulance experience or the various moonshot type projects? So, one of the ideas that we have is how to uh, basically make the environment that our, say, engineers and, and uh, robots work together. They are acting like partners rather than you know, competing who is doing it going to be better. So we have a lab that they are basically observing everything from human robots, you know, the drones, and we're collecting data in terms of the behavior of, uh, you know, say, students around drones in terms of safety. And we use that one to actually go back and sort of legislate how we can actually operate within the environment. So this is continuously taking you know, data and also helps for us when we do as scientists, engineers doing research, how to be respectful and mindful of other you know, autonomous systems and other actually colleagues, yes, yeah. colleagues. So, so this data basically is fed to a sort of dynamic AI system that Know, uh, comes up with ideas of how to improve and make the environment more efficient in, term, in terms of research and data. Okay, we're getting down to 10 minutes, so let's open it up to user questions and, and we can elaborate from there. Go ahead. I think they're bringing mics around. Yeah, thanks. Um, so it seems that in uh, the autonomous future that one of the big challenges that perhaps V to X uh, is going to have a little bit difficulty uh, addressing is going to be communication with pedestrians. Um, and so, what, what kind of systems do you see evolving to create that communication where a pedestrian could look at a car and understand what the car is thinking, understand if it's okay to be able to cross the street, understand, you know, since people can't uh, make eye contact anymore, will, be, will there be lights mounted on a vehicle that, that tell the pedestrian if it's okay or, or something to that effect? I'll take that. Um, so, contrary to your belief, we don't believe we need V to X to have autonomous driving. And our, our saying at work is, if we wait for 5G or this V to X, we won't have jobs. Um, I mean, because one can't, autonomous driving and the decisions cars are making today cannot depend on that level of communication. 
They need to make it all based on the data they're ingesting through their cameras, through the radar, through the LiDAR, and through the mapping that they've had downloaded that tells them where um, a, um, a bus stop bench is or where heavy pedestrian areas are. And if you look at any of these, the cars can see, can even tell when a, a pedestrian is going to step out from the curb. And they're doing those mathematical equations and making decisions based on that environment, making sure they're not in a situation that puts the car or the pedestrian at danger. So although you can't make eye contact, there are many times you see a pedestrian, you don't make an eye contact with them, but you know they're there and you're aware and watching what they're going to do. That's how these cars are going to behave, at least in the short term. We may get to a, a, a place where we're communicating with the cell phones, but probably not, not in my career. Any other different views? And I'm kind of young. I, I, would, I, I would agree that the vehicle is going to, the intelligence of the vehicle and the autonomy in the vehicle is going to overcome the um, randomness of the pedestrian. Um, and we can debate whether we like or don't like V to X. It's going to be mandated. Cars are going to be talking to cars very, very soon because too many lives are at stake. That's why I love this industry. I call it the Game of Thrones. You never know what's happening tomorrow. Uh, any more questions from the audience? Anyone I see? Go ahead. Uh, with the increased demand of electricity and the use of it, how are we going to supplement that with our current electrical, with the electrical grid with the increased focus on green and decreasing fossil fuel use? How are, you, how are we going to sustain our expansion? Uh, I'll take that because we work with utilities uh, all the time. Um, utilities are facing uh, flat load growth and increasing peak demand. So their costs are going up and their income is fixed or going down. Right? They're in a tight bind. Uh, electrified uh, mobility is really the next generation of business opportunity for utilities. So there's a combination of utilities moving to greener sources of uh, energy and they are very, very aggressively moving into the electrification of mobility and, and not just level one and level two charging and fast chargers that we think of today. Extreme fast chargers, uh, 350 to 500 kilowatt systems. That's just insanely fast. And, and they will start uh, with mass transit, right? Large buses, stopping, picking up people, taking an energy shot while they're loading and move on. Uh, or if you think of uh, individual platforms, I, I struggle to call them automobiles anymore. I think of them as low occupancy vehicles and high occupancy vehicles. But even the low occupancy vehicles in an extreme fast charging instance will be in minutes, right? It will begin to replicate the fossil fuel, the gasoline refill experience. So if utilities are looking at it. Utilities are investing heavily in it. And they will be a big part of the solution going forward. Okay. Next question. Take one right here. Already, since the mic's already over there. Oh, you got a mic. So I'm just thinking about the relationship between vehicles and the, the infrastructure around it. My, my perception is, and correct me if I'm wrong, that, that the tech companies and the vehicle manufacturers are way ahead of policy and, and thinking about what the, the built environment needs to be. You know, and, and if you go back to a, a visionary like Norman Bel Geddes, you know, future analyst for General Motors, you know, he envisioned autonomy you know, many decades ago and saw traffic, no stoplights at intersections, you know, traffic pulsing through the intersection, but it's going to require a lot from planning the infrastructure. Any comments about that? I mean, like, I can take that one. So, you know, we are at a time right now that things are absolutely at a tipping point. Now, policy cannot dictate innovation, but at the same time, in order to dictate policy, they need to know what is the change coming. So innovation has to happen, but then it has to really pass through very rigorous systems as to whether this is practical, whether this actually means, what are the changes we need to do. So the fact to your earlier question that it seems that the tech companies and the auto car manufacturers are ahead of the policy, yes, and it will be like that. Because once we know what is possible, then we need to go back and see, okay, is this doable? Otherwise, if we already put parameters around it, we are stifling innovation. I hope I answered your question. We'll follow the mics with the questions. Yeah, I've got the mic, so I guess yeah. I can <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm with the Fiber Optic Association. I'm part of the people who train the people who build your communications infrastructure. 
And one of the groups that we're dealing with right now who are very traumatized are cities. Because cities are trying to figure out what it means to be a smart city. They're trying to figure out what they need for infrastructure. They're building smart traffic light systems. They're building systems that support things like small cells. They're building Wi-Fi systems. They're building all these crazy things without really knowing what's going to happen with you. And my question is, starts with going to George. Who's writing the standards for vehicle to infrastructure communications so that cities know what to build? So that when we drive west on Wilshire and go from LA to Santa Monica, that the cars can still talk to the system or get off the 10 freeway and start driving over here on Fairfax. Where are those standards coming from and who's developing them? So in a nutshell, because I don't want to take too long, it's a, it's a uh, combination of federal, state, and local policies and regulations that will be uh, addressing those situations. I would say that as cities really struggle because, especially from a fiber optic association, right, the cities are struggling with how do we address 5G? 5G is going to be a very important accelerator for connected vehicles because they'll use uh, cellular Vita X technology to communicate. Uh, the short answer, and it has nothing to do with technology or policy, believe it or not, is stakeholder alignment. How do the stakeholders in that city, beyond just the city leadership, how do those regional stakeholders define their requirements that then gets codified into policy? I'm, I'm not glossing over it. The answer is not shiny technology. It's not some magic policy. It is stakeholder alignment, as boring as that sounds, and as hard as that is to do at that scale with large, complex organizations. Moria, at the moonshot level, are you thinking about how to bring it a, a something transformational into society in terms of legislation and city adoption? Or is that just a pure technology at that level? No, it's not pure technology, actually. Policy, and it's one of our main challenges right now. We're trying to negotiate, for example, the city of Pasadena, how to get our machine you know, from our campus to JPL. And we're just learning that also, as uh, you mentioned, cities don't know actually what is in play for the future. So they are always very conservative and giving you that little space because they don't know where it's, where it's going to be. So in our case, you know, we are trying to assure them that you know, we are going to work with them and also our autonomous policies are going to be adhering to the city policies. So it's kind of cultural things that we need to overcome, but that's our main challenge. Fantastic. We have one more qu time for one more question. Yes, yes the mic. Right. I'd like to ask the gentleman who was talking about uh, intuitive intelligence. You mentioned a car that reads your mood, that can tell whether you're happy or angry or whatever. What would you say to those of us who don't want our car spying on our mood and spying on our music and whatever else we're thinking or feeling that day? What if we just want to drive and not be spied upon by corporate or government big brother? Okay. So. Um, uh, do you have a Gmail account? No, I don't. Okay, great. Um, if you have a cell phone, if you have an email ID, pretty much data is being tracked all together. I've, I've heard that question many times before, and I absolutely understand your concerns. The issue is not about uh, essentially that the data is being collected, because it's being collected everywhere. It is about what is being done with that data. Is it being sold without your rights? or is it being used to give you a better driving experience? And also driving is not just an individual experience, it's a collective experience. So if by understanding your data, we can create safer roads and other lives, you know, are at stake, or we can actually have a safer driving experience, you are part of a you know, collective group. So that data is being used to build a better system. The issue really happens, what is happening to that data? And you know, data has been collected either ways. Welcome to the digital world. Okay? As much as it's a reality, I often think about. And all I have done is, we have a very strong personal ethos of what we want to do with the uh, data, of the fact that it has to be treated with utmost respect and security, and that cannot be sold without your you know, exactly. 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 Terrific. 
our time is up, which is unfortunate because I could spend hours listening to these guys. But uh, that's all we have for this panel. So.